So thank you. Uh, this is my first uh, genomic meeting here. So uh, just to back up, there's been a lot of references to the VA. I think it is the best uh, example uh, to the NHS or anything. It's, it's uh, a wonderful system. There are about 23 million veterans alive uh, with uh, 7 million who are expected to receive care this year. So it's a very large healthcare system, over 60 million uh, yearly visits, there are 153 medical centers, and then there are a lot of outpatient clinics. Uh, so over 1,400 total sites of care. All, all systems do use the same electronic medical record system, but actually they're not integrated across. We can finally get remote access to other ones, but there are about 180 separate servers involved, uh, so that, that's a different uh, issue. Uh, from my point of view as a clinical geneticist, the VA um, kind of lagged in delivery of genetic care behind a lot, of other, uh, a lot of other health provider organizations because we didn't have pediatrics. And I did a pediatric genetic fellowships and, 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 and you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, dysmorphology was, was a very big piece of genetic care. And then it evolved into uh, something very different. And, and so in academic centers now, it, it obviously involves oncology, neurology. Uh, but the VA kind of lagged. And, and uh, back in 2006, uh, then Secretary Peek really established the first genetic medicine program advisory committee with the goal of using genetic information to optimize clinical care, but also uh, recommending processes and goals for the development of a geno uh, VA genetic medicine program. Uh, so two years later, the committee was formed. Um, there was genetic care in the VA. Um, there are uh, 120 in round numbers of the VAs have academic affiliates. Obviously, they're high class uh, providers in all of these places, and they were they were providing care uh, one off in a neurology clinic, in a cardiology clinic, in an oncology clinic. Um, there were four actual board-certified clinical molecular gen uh, clinical geneticists uh, delivering care, uh, and uh, Los Angeles developed a center. Uh, but really, we only started capturing genetic workload. The VA didn't even use the workload to capture systems. Um, Genetics was integrated into research very quickly within the VA after this was announced. Uh, Sarah Knight will be talking as soon as I, I finish, as fast as I can here, uh, uh, will, will I think describe a lot of the HSR&D programs as well as the MVP. Uh, and, and they are, um, th those are incredibly large research programs, but the clinical program really lagged. And uh, so I was hired in, uh, I think, 2009 uh, as the national director and I quickly realized there was no service. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a little, uh, it sounds great until you realize that you have, you have uh, nothing to do. We, uh, I, I uh, hired the first actual clinical provider uh, as a clinical geneticist in, uh, in 2010, uh, excuse me, in 2011, and, um, and the one of, one of the key points in providing a centralized, integrated genomic service within the VA was an agreement between the VA and well, an understanding uh, with the Joint Commission that we could cross-credential people across all of the 153 medical centers. Um, so that's, that's uh, at least possible. Getting it done through the bureaucratic uh, web was interesting. Uh, so we hired our first counselor in 2011, and in March 2011, we got the first memorandum of understanding between two facilities. And then there, was, there, there are now 29 stop points that we've identified uh, in, in the process of, of delivering care. Um, telehealth has really made this possible. Uh, the VA bought into telehealth in a very big way. Uh, the goal is to have 50 percent of all patient encounters uh, done by telehealth. A lot of these are between the local VA medical center and what are called the community-based outpatient clinics, or CBOCs. There are about 1,000 of those. And so uh, the, the images of the, of the mothership and then the little outpatient clinics, and it keeps the veterans from driving um, 150 miles. They only have to drive 20 miles great place. They can get specialty care there. Uh, a lot of it is uh, telemental health. But I think the, the idea of genetic counseling, uh, where you're using a specialist as the primary care physician and then a genetic counselor and a backup medical geneticist, really works well and is integrated well into that potential model. Uh, an another program, I mean, I'm really surprised, there's a big ICU program with tele-ICU, where rural hospitals have an ICU, uh, but they can get support from, uh, with a little robotic interface from, from an intensivist at a 
much higher acuity hospital. Uh, so we really built a centralized service in Salt Lake City. Um, this is where we were uh, one year ago, and here is where we are now. Uh, so we're delivering care in uh, actively, I think, in 47 or 48 places. We have over 60 memoranda of understanding signed uh, to deliver care, uh, but um, the IT infrastructure lags. You have to get permission from each hospital and get integrated into their system. Uh, my counselors ha have to log on to each medical center every 30 days to maintain their passwords. We have an encrypted log. Uh, so if you can imagine trying to keep track of 153 uh, user IDs and logins just to be able to deliver care. There's got to be a better way. Uh, we're going to work on that. Uh, here's the setup. These are actually two counselors talking to each other, uh, but it's just done through uh, a nice setup. And here's the way the workload has increased through the, uh, the, first, the first quarter of this year. So we're just we're exponentially increasing, which is really fun. And here's the, uh, the agreements with TSAs. Um, a lot of this has been through uh, the, the telemedicine capacity, uh, over a third of it. About a third of it is e-consults, and a lot of the driver of that is from pathology. Uh, we, get, we get consults from, um, I, I think well over half of the e-consults are from pathology saying, is this test appropriate? Uh, how, do we, how do we handle this? Um, the pathologists in question a lot of times are not uh, certified molecular pathologists. There are um, more than a handful of excellent certified molecular pathologists within the VA, uh, but a lot of these go to the regional lab. They're just saying in the VA, if you've seen one VA, you've seen one VA. Uh, they're kind of entrenched. Uh, and so the test lands that are at, at a local VA medical center that may not have anybody skilled in molecular pathology. Uh, so we handle those. Um, we, st we also just do a lot by telephone. As soon as we have the memorandum of understanding signed, uh, we can get in there and legitimately contact the veteran, and then we're emailing encrypted notes, it's, but it, it does work. Um, we, we have gotten um, referrals from every department and division within the VA with the sole exception of, of the emergency room. Um, so, and I imagine that's going to happen one of these days. Uh, so we're, we're, we've really made uh, inroads into every place. Usually when we get into a site, uh, we give an in-service. The big users are our oncology women's clinic, which also includes uh, breast cancer, obviously, uh, GI. Um, so, you know, the needs and gaps, uh, I, I'm trying to close here. Uh, I, I, you know, ev everything that we've heard today is, I think there's a tremendous consensus in the room about what the needs are. Uh, clearly, integration with EMR is the big one. The one thing that hasn't been mentioned yet uh, is the structured family history. And if you're looking at Amsterdam or Bethesda criteria, you're, you're looking at BRCA Pro, uh, you, you want to, if you're going to commute, uh, if you're going to computerize that for decision support for some busy primary care physician at the point of care, you really need to have a structured family history. I, I know there's a conference a little later this week that might address some of that. I'm going to the conference in San Francisco on disparities of care. So, uh, but, but, Building computerized decision support all the way through and making this seamless has got to happen. There's no way that any of us who are, uh, you know, no matter how, how good we are and how long we've been doing this can, can keep track of all the polymorphisms. Uh, I think the processes, as was just alluded, uh, you know, the, the idea that uh, there should not be a genetic exceptionalism either in the ways that we order the test or anything, it's, it's just another test. Uh, and and it's, it's just more medical information. How, how can we use that? How are we going to run this into, uh, how are we going to build this into large scale? There are uh, 3,000, I think, uh, or very close to 3,000 individual genetic tests performed commercially in the United States right now. And, uh, and then if, as we approach whole genome sequencing or exome sequencing or regulome or, or whatever it is, how, how we're going to divide that. There are also, so these are sort of the ex, more external issues. I think the in internal issues, building a service within the VA, uh, I, I was at a, a meeting in, in DC a little less than a year ago and, and they, they were suggesting 
words that describe the VA as flexible and responsive, and those of us from the field were saying, uh, you know, glacial, monolithic, bureaucratic, and, 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 and working this through so that we can get access to the high quality molecular labs and centralizing those uh, so that we can, so that we can uh, work with IT, which is a local issue, work between all the medical centers. Uh, all of those are issues, but I, I think, you know, I can, I, I can just go back to that trajectory slide. So um, I, I also work in research, and, and so I'll, I'll turn over now to my co colleague from ORD, uh, but thank you.